Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. What an esteemed group. And as uh, Doug said, and um, I'm the, serving as the director of the Office of Enterprise Sustainability for the state of Minnesota in the Department of Administration, but our office was originally created under the Dayton administration through executive order. And then um, Governor Walls reaffirmed that when he took over in, um, as governor last, last spring uh, or in 2018. Um, the executive order outlines um, some very clear um, sustainability goals for the various state agencies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce energy in their buildings, reduce the fuel, fossil fuel consumption in their fleets. Um, we have a goal to divert waste into recycling on organics. Yeah. Governor Walls and uh, Lieutenant Governor or Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan have really set some bold and ambitious goals. As you know, they've got um, also set up a sub cabinet on. Um, climate change. Um, and what our agency does is work with the 24 cabinet level agencies to implement our, the projects. And we keep track of all of their data and we report on that. And we're also available to provide some technical assistance to local governments. Um, this is what how we define sustainability. I mean, it's a pretty standard one. Um, definition, we are certainly having an eye towards equity, equity um, and state government has been a priority um, of the Governor Dayton and Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan as well. Um, I think what was interesting was how this was formed. This was um, uh, is kind of our governance structure. It was modeled after, and this was before I took over, um, um, uh, Commissioner Larry Herkey was my predecessor. He's now the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs. But um, under the Dayton administration, they pulled together all kinds of state agency staff people and did a long, extensive process to look at what were various state agencies doing about sustainability, what were some of the goals or, uh, that were maybe in executive orders or in state statutes. And, but then we looked at a governance structure that was similar to what some businesses were doing. Um, so we have the uh, governor and lieutenant governor leads our steering team. We have eight um, cabinet level um, commissioners on our steering team. Five of them are permanent. It's admin, DNR, commerce, pollution control agency, and MnDOT. And then we have three um, uh, commissioners from uh, other state agencies kind of representing. We have uh, um, Minnesota Housing, they lease space, they don't own space. We have um, Human Services, which is a huge, big operations. And then we also have the Department of Education kind of ser serving currently on our steering team. Then there's our office, as we said, that provides the technical assistance. We have work groups, three of them that are in um, one work group of state agency staff is focused on energy, greenhouse gas emissions and water. Then we have another uh, work group that is focused on solid waste and procurement. And then a third work group that is focused on the fleets. Um, each state agency is uh, to identify sustainability coordinators in, in the executive order. And then they need to build a team of staff people that are working to kind of advance um, and work on implementing these goals. Does that make sense? So these are our sustainability goals that we have outlined. Um, they are, um, you know, pretty aggressive. Some of them could be more aggressive. I know questions were raised about the greenhouse gas emissions last year by a few of the legislators, whether we would um, be having a more aggressive greenhouse gas uh, goal. I think we're close to meeting the current goal because a lot of the decarbonization of the electric grid. And so we will be trying to look at that one. I think another one that we seem to be doing well on is the procurement one. And maybe that one needs to be a little bit more aggressive as well. Um, so our agencies put together um, a uh, variety of, um, or two annual reports. We're currently assembling all the data for 20, um, 2019, excuse me, and we put them in a, both a printed report, but then we also have the information on a dashboard I wanted to kind of show you. What we've been able to do is put together data from um, the 24 state agencies. They have all the buildings that are over 5,000 square feet. We have, um, you know, more than 11,000 vehicles that we keep track of. So we've uploaded all the state uh, agencies' 
energy data and water data is in a, a tool called B3. So we've updated all of that or uploaded all of that information. There's a kind of a variety of um, databases that keep track of fuel consumption for the various agency. They have to manually enter in all the garbage bills and things like that. But basically our reporting tool that we have, this is kind of the back of house information about how we're doing on greenhouse gas emissions. But um, where it's keeping track of, you know, more than 6 million, you know, data sets, it's, you know, and growing. So last year, one of the things I wanted to show you is we launched this public facing dashboard. We're really excited about that, that it's, um, we think one of the first, it's one of the most comprehensive and probably one of the first of its kind in the country. California has one, but it's not nearly as uh, comprehensive as ours. So we launched this um, sustainabilitymn.web or .gov, excuse me, um, website last year. And I'm gonna try to see if I can get to it live here. Oh, good. Um, so here's the, uh, the uh, dashboard. It has information for um, the two, uh, just the two years so far. We're by early August or mid-August, we'll have the 2019 information in there. But you can see how the, um, if you click on the various toggles, oh, hopefully it's going to go. Yeah. Um, you know, we, as I was trying to say that there's, you can toggle on the various um, four, uh, the six areas, and that gives you the report for the um, full enterprise, but then you can also click and get information on um, each of the state agencies. If up in the corner, you can get the collective agency scores, but if you go to each of these, yep, there's the scores for each of the agencies on the various areas. But you can also go in and see how they're doing and what their breakdowns are of like how much, how many vehicles they have, how much gas they've consumed and, um, or how much biodiesel they've used or you know B20 or B10 or those things. So the data is all there. Oh, that's cool. Um, so, yeah, but this, as I said, it's a very transparent way we've only, We'll have three years of data now. Um, this is really helping us focus on some areas. We were just discussing with um, with the Metro Transit and Metro Mobility. Um, you, they use a lot of gasoline for operating their Metro Mobility vehicles. And right now there's not an electric vehicle option for those that um, specific vehicle. And I think it's something that we really want to look at. Obviously they need to keep the Metro Mobility vehicles um, warm and cool. They do a lot of um, stopping and starting. It takes a lot of time idling while they're loading people in and out of the vehicles. And so it gives us an area to kind of focus on um, once we've had this um, information. So it, um, but as I said, this would be kind of how the whole um, enterprise is doing on energy consumption. We also in 2018 had a really cold winter, so we um, consumed a lot of energy in our, in our buildings, keeping them warm. Um, but this would be how we're, we're collectively doing with greenhouse gas emissions. This would be for the um, uh, Department of Administration's actual score. So Department of Administration has been doing well. We purchase, um, we're, we have on, we're on Excel. We, um, we um, are participating in their um, Renewable Connect piece as well. Um, and this would be kind of the breakdown and you can see whether it's, you know, for each agency, whether they're having energy from electricity or from wind or from natural gas, or, if, you know, some agencies are still using uh, fuel oil and we're trying to keep track of the renewables as well. So go in and play on the website. I think that was just my, the point that I wanted to make. And I'm sorry that we have some technical difficulties and stuff. But it's an interesting thing, and it's um, a way for us to really be transparent with the public as to, you know, what is the state agencies, various agencies doing to meet both our greenhouse gas emissions goals, but our broader sustainability goals. Go and then we have, you know, some, uh, um, some resources. Our annual reports are there, but we also have an FAQ and information about the methodology of how we do our calculations. I know that this group is a kind of a technical group, so you probably would want to know and dive into some of those um, potential resources as well. 
So today I know Doug had wanted me to share a little bit about what are the state um, agencies doing to advance renewable energy in particular. Um, I think solar is one where we have a number of agencies working on. Um, DNR was an early leader on this. Um, they have 39 installations, 34 of them are PV, and um, then they have five that are solar thermal. This map on the left shows you um, you know, where they're distributed at their various state parks. This picture on the right is their um, Glencoe, uh, Glen, Glenwood area office. This is a net zero um, building that was completed, I think in 2018. Um, and it has the solar on, um, on the side there as well. The DNR has, I think, four different kind of installation types. They've got, um, They've got pole mounted ones, they've got pole mounted with tracking, they've got some ground and some other roof mounted um, installations. And can they I make a comment on this on, on sure. that photograph? That's rather interesting because uh, some of us have been around when we used to have a strong uh, passive solar program. Uh -huh. Observed that the, that the uh, solar panels are placed so that they provide summertime uh, shading of those lower windows. So it's actually a, a combination uh, solar, uh, active solar and uh, passive solar installation. Well, good, thanks John so much for adding. I know this is their second net zero building that the DNR did. Um, I think Krauss Anderson was the firm that did the construction project. Um, I have not been out to see the facility. Um, and they, uh, so as I said, DNR's kind of been an early leader on that. Has anybody else been out to see it? No. Okay. Um, so next, military affairs, when uh, Commissioner Herkey was with, um, with the reserves really pushed to do, as people know, um, with the National Guard did a 10 megawatt array with Minnesota Power um, out at Camp Ripley. This is, um, it covers about 80 acres of underutilized um, government property there. Um, it was, I think, a project that was initiated in 2016 and it was a you know $23 million project, as I said, a kind of partnership with Minnesota Power and help Minnesota Power kind of achieve um, some of its renewable energy goals as well. So this is a really impressive installation. You guys should set up a tour of that. You know, um, we should. Right now, they um, they probably would let us go up and tour the um, the panels. You know, the Veterans Affairs, Military Affairs, and you know, he, some of them have been kind of on lockdown with the COVID stuff. But I think we, I think we've all been up there because the world's <laughs> largest ice carousel is maybe three miles away from that site. And there's a right outside, there's a restaurant called the main gate. So. Okay. We all went up with our family and they started having a meat raffle. It's like, <laughs> I've never been to a place with a meat raffle before. Oh, well, how long have you lived in Minnesota then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, about 20 some years. Well, you're a little, I'm not sure. Not too long. Yeah. The, the, how mm. could you not have been to a meat raffle before? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, that'll, that's a side conversation. We'll have to do. Okay. Um, the Met Council's been doing a lot of innovative things. Um, this is a photo of the park and ride at um, Highway uh, 610 and Noble. The, you know, the uh, panels are on the south facing side of it. It was an interesting conversation. I guess the community was not so happy about a parking ride coming in and Met Council was exploring having um, some kind of a screen to kind of, you know, block the view of vehicles and things like that. And it turned out that they could just as cost effectively put up um, this solar installation on it. Um, I think they have, um, Let's see. So far, I think the you know Metro Transit um, is subscribing to 7.6 megawatts of um, community solar gardens, which I think is at about 12%. Um, they're seeing about a 12% savings on those. 
They um, also have been working with a partnership, a green partnership with Excel Energy that they had announced back in 2018 um, that was going to allow them to be able to purchase a clean renewable energy and allow the Met Council to operate its wastewater treatment facilities and its transit exclusively on energy from renewable energy sources by 2040. So they've had some uh, really aggressive goals. I know they're working on their updating their current sustainability plan as well. Um, they have about uh, 10 megawatts of solar behind the meter um, at uh, various property locations that they had. And I'm sorry, I think they, I'm, I misspoke. I think they subscribed to a total of about 19 um, megawatts of community solar and community solar gardens. Um, and I think that's it. And this was kind of just the, um, showing how they've been, you know, over the last um, five, six, seven years, really working on kind of increasing their um, their utilization of solar and what the savings results has been for for the agency. They've really been a leader on on, on a number of things. The Met it's important for the enterprise for the Met Council to. Um, that succeeded doing this because for um, the entire enterprise, I think they can they um, use about 25% of all the energy consumed in the 24 agencies. And so obviously because they're operating wastewater treatment facilities and um, the transit light rail systems and stuff. So it's important that they continue to work and advance renewable energy. Um, uh, Department of Transportation um, has also really been doing some innovative things. Um, they had launched in um, October of uh, 2018 with a Cooperative Energy Futures, kind of a community solar garden project, and this is on top of their Ramp A, where they had um, a, a large focus on trying to get uh, residential households and particularly low and modest income residential communities to um, be able to subscribe to this uh, community garden. So it was really quite innovative. They've, um, I think, now expanded. They did an RFP uh, last yeah. year. Uh, yep. Uh, just a yeah. quick comment. Uh, sure, absolutely. Fill in whatever I, you can know, sure John, I don't know. I'm sure that's a MnDOT facility, but it's not ramp I, Oh. Run, there, that's not. Maybe the next one is. Oh. Well, this is one that they're sub subscribing to. Is that the one that did I go the wrong way? Nope. Ramp Ramp A is a, is a huge, huge uh, flat solar installation. Uh, it's not located on a roof like that. No. Nope. Oh, so I must have had the wrong photo. I must have put the wrong photo in then. Yeah, no, that's fine. I just so people don't understand. Because yeah, it's, it's, it's possible to go over and park in Ramp A and get an up up close uh, view of that installation uh, from the, the top level of the parking ramp. Yeah. Um, shoot, do you remember, John, how, what the size of it is? Oh. Uh, it's is it like a? Is it a half? A, yeah, I I'm sorry. Um, I must have missed not put that number in my notes here. No, that's fine. I just thought I would, I, I, I definitely have some information on it. I can yeah. send you. Yeah, they, um, so that, as I said, that one was really innovative because they were using, being able to utilize the roof of their, their parking ramps, but then also having it as a, you know, on, um, with a focus on the community solar gardens and um, particularly with uh, low and modest income people being able to subscribe, including some people living, you know, in um, some affordable housing. So, And it's I a benefit to the people who use the ramp. It benefits the people that use the ramp because it provides shading on that upper level. Yes, that's right, too. Thank you. Um, and this was kind of a distribution of, they did an RFP back in 2019 to subscribe to some community solar gardens where they, MnDOT had some of their installations. And so um, I think the ones in the light blue are the ones that MnDOT subscribed to. And um, I think they uh, have subscription agreements for a 7.4 million um, kilowatt hours of electricity. So the picture on the left is one that they're subscribing to in Faribault. It was a 1.3 um, megawatt solar garden and they have about 500 kilowatts of that, the 40%. 
Mindat's also working on a couple of projects that right now, this year, they've been able to keep moving forward, even with COVID, they're working on, um, uh, I think, they're partnering on a community solar garden in Afton, and they're doing a small uh, 40KW on one of their um, truck stations in Northfield. So they continue to try to look at it, but I think their big accomplishment was subscribing to this larger um, community solar gardens. So the Department of Admin, where I'm working, the first solar installation at the Capitol Complex was on the Senate Office Building. Um, and that was when the Senate Office Building was completed. Um, now we have um, a total of four. We did an additional um, 300 kilowatts on the Department of Administration. Um, that's the photo on the right. That's, that has two roofs. Um, so this is the lower roof. We did it on the Department of Admin. Um, we also did it on the Stassen Building, which houses the Revenue Office and um, the Department of Revenue and on the Transportation Building. So again, we had an, kind of an additional 300 uh, KW that went live last winter. Um, I think we were excited to be able to use um, the Helene modules out of um, Mountain Iron and the racking came from Unirac out of Alexandria. So we were able to, you know, utilize Minnesota companies as well as um, Innovative Powers did that installation. The Department of Admin also, we spent about $5 million a year or had been on electricity and we, um, back in 2016, we um, announced a 20 year agreement with Excel to do their renewable connect for government, which is you know, gonna save us about $100,000 a year. So that was also kind of innovative at that time. So um, some things that are kind of coming up next that I wanted to share with people, um, and certainly we can have um, some questions, was that one of the things that our office has been able to do is do these master contracts. The Department of Administration has the State Office of Procurement, and by having a master contract, this um, we did one, we call uh, we. Solar Possible, now we've just updated it, but this allows the state agencies to be able to, um, we found that some of the state agencies didn't necessarily have the technical expertise to really review um, solar contracts and understand what those, uh, you know, what all the terms were and things like that. And that was one of the barriers for them for participating. So by having a solar master contract with all those terms and um, um, conditions that are all agreed on in advance, and then the agencies can use those contracts we all, by also having um, master contracts, uh, local units of government can also buy off of those contracts. So we, on our first round, I know we had about three megawatts of solar was procured through this process. The city of San, South St. Paul was able to use the master contract and did a 450 KW system. I know the city of Edina and Hennepin County utilized this as well. So we just had put that one out for bid earlier this year. I think the um, State Office of Procurement is just finalizing all the details with um, the vendors. And so that will, as I said, be available for state agencies as we start to move out of COVID and they can identify some projects. We'll have that done. Um, as people in this team, I'm sure know the Environmental Quality Board has been looking at and studying um, the potential for solar on closed landfills. Um, our office um, has been participating along with the Department of Commerce and a number of other agencies on that. They're going to have a report that's due to the legislature in December of this year. So they've been working really diligently on that and looking at what are the opportunities, what have been some of the barriers and what are some of the opportunities to be able to utilize those uh, closed landfills as potential sites for solar PV. So that's exciting. Um, I just wanted to say, too, that the state has, you know, the sustainable building guidelines that are any state bonded project is required to do. The new guidelines come into effect for 2020, which makes the buildings need to be 80 percent more um, energy efficient than the 2003 energy code. And so this means, I think, to be able to get there just with energy efficiency is going to maybe be a stretch. And so that you'll start to see, I think, more renewables added on to these bonding projects as the um, requirements become, um, you know, more, more strict. Um, some things that I was disappointed about, um, the, um, you know, we, 
I had initially, when we started, tried to propose having um, using bonding dollars for doing solar projects. Minnesota Management and Budget has felt like those are not eligible expenses for bonding. We're going to continue to try to um, answer their questions about that. Um, so I had hoped to try to get some money to be able to um, help assist the state agencies to, uh, you know, do more renewable energy projects. It was kind of disappointing in the Ways and Means Committee this last week, or this week in the House Ways and Means Committee, the new bonding, uh, the new $1.8 billion bonding proposal did not include two bonding projects that were going to be on state facilities. There was one that um, Department of Human Services had, I think they could have done about a, um, a half a megawatt project at their NOCA site, and then the Department of Corrections was going to do a kind of an innovative um, consolidation of their transportation equipment, mm -hmm. and um, they were going to have electric vehicle charging and as well as some solar uh, PV on that facility, and neither one of those projects were included in this most recent draft. So um, I think that, I know it's not as sexy as schools, but you know we have a lot of facilities that are operating 24 seven in the enterprise that would make good candidates uh, for doing more renewable energy on um, them. I think we're gonna, we've been really focused on trying to reduce the energy consumption in the facilities, but we'll be starting to look at, you know, is there some other uh, locations that might be, you know, larger sites that um, I don't think, I'm not sure anybody has one as big as the Camp Ripley one did, but, um, you know, also looking at some opportunities from some larger ground mount systems that might be on a campus at a correction facility or as, you know, Department of Human Services was looking at for one of their facilities. So that's kind of it of what I had to say. Um, I'm happy to take questions and uh, talk with people further. Um, and do you do you know if um, the state package is that is that at all of eligible for like the, the University of Minnesota or is that totally separate? Um, I'm sorry, Doug. I didn't hear the whole question. What what was it? I said you know that state package that you said you know different cities could uh, participate in. Oh. Is that That's, apply for the University of Minnesota or is that separate? Nope, I think that there are also, um, you know, we have this um, state office of procurement and then they have um, a, a, a cooperative purchasing agreement with a number of entities. So I know a number of tribal units of government can use those contracts as well as the state, um, state university system and the University of Minnesota, as well as there are some qualifying um, nonprofit organizations that can use it a lot too. But the last round on the solar, as I said, it was mostly um, municipalities and um, Hennepin County. Uh, we've been trying to work with CERTs and the Green Step cities to make those things, um, people more aware of that. Um, like currently we're working on, it's not out yet, but we're working on an electric vehicle charging um, equipment master contract for the state agencies to use. But then again, that would be something that um, municipalities or other local units of government could use too. I mean, you know, I think what we're trying to do is get things out easier and quicker for people to utilize. And if we've already had a team that's done all the due diligence and reviewed all the contracts and terms and conditions and stuff, you know, just buy it through the state contract then. Um, does your does your office uh, this is Doug again? Does yeah. your office uh, work at all with the funds that came back from the Volkswagen settlement? Does does that get involved? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, that right now the state agent. Seats. There were there were early ones that um, were eligible for state. Uh, for state agencies. Um, because of the size and kind of the scope that they had, we had um, the agencies try to apply for them themselves. Um, I haven't seen the latest version. We've been working right now, I should have said, in a positive note, in the bonding bill that is being discussed currently, there was $2 million for electric vehicle charging equipment um, for state agencies, for our state fleets. We want to do some DC fast chargers um, at some state-owned facilities that would be available for the fleet, but then the public could also use it. So um, the one I always give as an example is that rest stop as you're going up to Brainerd that MnDOT has and DNR, that we would put a DC fast charger there that would be available for the fleet, but the public could use it as well. Oh. So 
um, you know, I'm I'm hoping that that will happen. Um, we're um, talking about EVs again. Sorry, we're part, pi, uh, piloting our working with the pilot project that Excel got approved from the Public Utilities Commission to try to put some um, probably maybe as many as 200 level two charging stations again available for the EV fleet. But we've had um, some challenges getting um, the fleet in greater Minnesota. So we have a number of state agencies that have people that have to travel regularly to greater Minnesota and, you know, they're reluctant to get a, an electric vehicle if they're not sure they're going to be able to um, charge it quickly and then return on their trip. So that's why we're excited about this, you know, proposal to maybe put, um, I think it was 13 DC fast chargers and maybe a hundred um, level two charging. Do you, do you have any sense of, uh, electric vehicles in the state fleet i mean is it 20 percent or less or oh it's less than that right now i think it's um you know in the light duty numbers oh shoot doug let me i'll have to pull it up um let me let me pull up something else and um try to get you but um we yeah the um i think the as i tried to say we have we have like six thousand um, light duty vehicles um, or light fleet vehicles, but they um, don't cons you know that's not where the majority of the fuel is consumed. Um, so I'm trying to think of what the actual number is. Somebody else asked me a question while I try to figure out the answer to Doug's because I can't remember off the top of my head. And it's six forty at night, Doug. My yeah, recall yeah. is not as good. Sorry. <laughs> well, as you say, they were supposed to have the Hydrovision convention at the convention center um, this week, but it got canceled due to COVID-19. And then um, it got moved to the convention center in November, and then it got moved to Portland in next year. But during the discussion, they said that um, hydro sites and solar are natural buddies because they have the land. And so... I was going to talk to Doug about it, but um, there's a Josh Peterson down at Cannon Falls Dam as a, maybe a speaker for us, but maybe he'd be a good one to talk to to see if he's in charge of that dam, you know, whether they could add solar to the dam. And then because they already have all the uh, electrical equipment needed to run the power, you know, to the grid already there. So you just add the solar. So I was just throwing that out to kill some time while you're looking up that yeah, I think that right now the um, the electric vehicles are about 2% of the fleet. We have about 16% of the fleet is hybrids of the light duties. So, um, you know, as right now, like the Department of Administration mostly ha um, the leases vehicles to most of the state agencies, MnDOT and um, Department of Public Safety and Corrections do their own, but on light duty. So we have... Um, the vehicles are there for five years or 85,000 miles, and then they that's like the uh, good point for them to have a resale of the vehicles. So it does allow us to keep putting in newer, more fuel-efficient vehicles. We have a goal that um, agencies are supposed to buy um, EPA level seven vehicles, um, you know, so th they have an EPA score of seven or higher. And we've been able to, as I said, made big progress in the last three years on, on buying um, EVs. But the hybrids have continued to be very popular, as I said, because some people are a little bit worried about the range anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anne, I have a question. Um, Hi, Chris. Chris. Hi, how are you? Doing well. <laughs> I didn't know you joined us. Yeah, nice to see you. I've been here a while, just didn't have the video on. Um, I was wondering, uh, well, a couple things. You you flashed a, a slide from the website. I think it was available to everyone on your data collection. Yep. And, you know, reporting on, on that. And you mentioned it was all, you know, people needed to, your people needed to hand enter, you know, use, uses of things. Well, so the solid waste one is the one that they still have to hand enter the bills on. The other ones are pretty much automated. We're, we're still waiting for a lot of the electric bills, I should say. I'm sorry, not all the utility bills are automated either. 
Here was, was is there a is there a CO two equivalent in terms of how you how you translate mm-hmm. for that? Yep. How how does that work? And that's one question. And then the other is, and I I've asked folks at Fresh Energy this. Um, okay, Jay, then Jay better pipe in for me. <laughs> Jay Drake Hamilton, is she there? She's on the call. Yep. Oh, I think. Okay. Um, she we was. talked about this a long time ago after she had come back from the Paris uh, talks. How I, I was just wondering about how data gets integrated into a larger, you know, national and then global picture in terms of climate, um, and and if if the templates are shared, you know, I mean, if there's a universal template or your part of uh, maybe Minnesota's part of developing a template that other people can use to report data that get, gets you get what I'm where I'm going with that. yeah I mean we use we're counting the scope one and scope two emissions we followed the general protocol that um, has been outlined um, for doing that so we're not doing the scope three emissions um, and as I said what on our research what scope three emissions what what does that mean well Okay, somebody help me out. The scope three emissions would be the um, emissions that come from producing a product. Oh, okay. So, the life know, cycle kind of. Uh, yeah, so we are, we do have a, some sustain, we have some, you know, products that are 100% sustainable that we have and we procure and we keep track of the greenhouse gas emissions from those. But like we're not going back and looking at every piece of equipment or that the state agencies have purchased. So we have what the greenhouse gas emissions would be coming from, you know, the grid um, that we have for electricity or our district energy system for the capital complex, or if they're using, you know, distributed fuels like fuel oil and, you know, for diesel generators or something like that. We keep, and we have all of that calculated. And then we also do what the greenhouse gas emissions would be from the, from the power sector. Okay. Is there like a department just in charge of that? Well, we work, <laughs> we work with, um, you know, yeah, it is. And so if you look at our website up on under the sustainabilitymn.gov, there's a resource tab and it shows the methodology in which we do all the calculations for our stuff. Okay. So cool. it's up there. Then the other question I had was related to the solid waste uh, recycling. Do you, uh, are you investigating, way, are you recycling solar panels? Are you researching that? Good question. Um, yes, the Jordan Lenti on my team was part of the team that has been looking at that. I think in our new procurement um, our RFP that I was talking about, our master contract, we will be asking agencies, our vendors, what they're doing with their modules. And then the other question related to that is the repurposing and then final disposal and possible recycling of, of lithium batteries. Mm-hmm. Are you, mm. Is that part of the picture as well? We we have not been um, tracking that at this time. Um, most of the stuff that we've got are still in operations with all of our vehicles and things. Um, but we're certainly keeping up on the various technologies of that. And I had recently, you know, listened in on a webinar. About, but, so, um, yeah. Okay. You know, and I should have said, Chris, that just the solid waste stuff that we're doing is the regular MSW that would be generated. So, you know, paper, cans, and bottles, corrugated cardboard. Um, We do do organics at the Capitol Complex and at a few of the other facilities in the metro area. I think our challenge with doing organics in greater Minnesota is there's not a lot of the infrastructure there. Um, but we, and we were very supportive of the pollution control agency had some bonding proposals to try to increase the capacity of some of these greater, uh, these recycling stations in greater Minnesota for the infrastructure. You know, um, you, you, you bring up something I just wondered about. So I end up running all of my, you know, your, your paints and your, your digital equipment and all of that out to, I run it out to Rich, Richfield or Bloomington site out there. Mm-hmm. Is that that state? Is that state? Of, is that a state-run agency, or is that city? That's no. the city of Wilmington. Yeah, I, no. John's shaking his head. I'm, of course, I'm more familiar with Ramsey County from my previous work than I am Hennepin County. But for the state, we are um, we purchase Energy Star equipment, and then our vendor does take them back and recycle all of the state-purchased electronic equipment. That's yeah. Hennepin County. 
Yeah, Hennepin, Hennepin County. Hennepin County. Hennepin County. Right. It's like all the but, really bad stuff goes, goes to those places. Yeah, but the state has had, um, you know, um, sustainable procurement for electronics in its state contracts for, you know, more than a decade now. And so they've been very conscious about, about that piece. And then I would just one last question. Anything about wind? Um, we, we, we've asked you about solar, but I was just wondering yeah, about other, think, other, other technologies. There was, um, the DNR had one small turbine that they've had a lot of problems with. It was, can, John, you might remember when they, in, John's nodding his head, they installed that, I don't know, and it, it's right now it's decommissioned. So we haven't had anybody, um, I think, currently doing any wind projects. Uh, um, okay. But, you. you know, I think that that's something that we do want to, um, to look at if there was an appropriate, you know, facility in a location, you know, that, you know, they could put up a 2.5 megawatt, you know, installation. But right now, most of them have just been um, either focused on their energy efficiency stuff. Well, frankly, most of the state agencies right now are just really focused on the COVID stuff. I mean, our biggest, you know, energy users are uh, the Met Council, you know, Met Council, Metro Transit, DNR, MnDOT, um, but then um, uh, Corrections, Human Services, and Veterans Affairs. You know, we have, I should have said that at the beginning, of the 24 agencies, only 10 of them actually own property. The other ones are leasing facilities. And we do work with the, um, the Department of Admin works with the agencies on leasing facilities. So we've got green leasing guidelines also in, you know, in place. And as those leases come up, we try to make improvements on them. Sorry, John, were you going to fill in about wind? Yeah. No, no, no. This is a separate subject. subject. You mentioned many state agencies. And I know that there was a quite a changeover once uh, Waltz uh, became governor uh, because he had some uh, appointments that were not consistent or uh, changed from Dayton's. Uh, how dependent uh, is your office? I mean, how, how dependent are your programs on the mm, attitude, the aggressiveness, the uh, the um, astuteness of the commissioners, of the, like for instance, uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher. I mean, she, you know, in transportation, she's got a huge responsibility. I don't know yeah. how cooperative she's been. Well, she's been great, and she promoted. Well, Commissioner Charlie Zelly was really good and got a lot of this stuff. And he had hired a gentleman named Tim Sexton to kind of lead the sustainability piece under Mar uh, Commissioner Margaret Kelleher Anderson. She's promoted Tim to being assistant commissioner. And he has a team of like five people that work on MnDOT sustainability stuff. They've recently published their uh, sustainability report. So they've been one. And again, I think, you know, I have to give a lot of credit. It was before my time, but I give a lot of credit to Commissioner Charlie Zelly, who really tried to start to embed sustainability in their organization and then made the financial commitment to hire some staff to do that. I think initially, you know, um, sharing amongst friends, you know, I think uh, the executive order under the Dayton administration came very late in the term. And so I think some people thought, you know, he's going to not, he's, you know, he's going to be terming out. We don't have to really maybe spend a lot of effort on this, but governor walls right away then re, you know, reaffirmed the executive orders. So I saw um, a lot more attention being paid to it. I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with the commissioner. So, you know, um, the corrections facility, for example, I think initially they had um, assigned it to the sustainability to a woman on their team that was doing some other things, but she was very interested in it. But then they realized that, oh my goodness gracious, they really do need a lot more resources put into this. So now they've got a full-time sustainability person. I mean, they really could use, you know, four or five of them. But the sustainability coordinator is, and um, and then his boss reports to one of the deputy commissioners and corrections, and she's really trying to build um, teams of sustainability people at each of their campuses. So, you know, that there's somebody at the fair bow that's paying attention to water and energy and garbage, you know, I think are the three areas that they, that agency wants to focus on particularly. So does that kind of make sense? And this is Doug again. I, 
Question, uh, you know, with the different solar projects that have been installed and stuff, has there been any use at all of storage with any of those projects that you know of? Not at this time. I think that that's something we definitely want to explore. Oh, I forgot to say that we, the Department of Admin, we are also on a totally different note, but I just want to mention this. We are looking at an aquifer thermal storage um, site for, you know, potential for the capital complex. So we're, you know, we've got the PV, we're on the district energy system. District energy is, you know, looking or talking with Excel about maybe electrifying their, their system. But I think the storage would be something. I mean, our, our biggest challenge is, frankly, folks, we, we need money to do this stuff. Um, that, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance at all of these, you know, facilities. And it was kind of disappointing to see, like, for corrections, there was a number of really great energy projects mm -hmm. in their asset management or their uh, asset preservation request. And they got less than half of what they asked for, or about half of what they asked for. And then this really great project that, um, as I said, was going to kind of consolidate their transportation, do a bunch of electrification of their fleet, and then have the solar, which would have been, and they has to follow this um, SB 2030. So it would have been kind of their flagship, most sustainable building, kind of set the standard for their agency, and it didn't get funded this year. What about a, a GoFundMe? GoFundMe page. <laughs> GoFundMe. <laughs> Friends, I know it. friends of the state. Friends of the state. So we have to have, like, uh, the, really, the, you know, I know there was a lot of energy or, and people were supportive of solar on schools, but we could do a lot of solar, you know, on some of these state facilities. Then, you know, a number of them are going to be there for the next 20, 30 years, right. um, you know, especially on ones that are 24-7 operations. Um, Is there a way of marketing that to another organization or private, uh, public-private a group to make that happen? Yeah, I mean, that's possible. I mean, I think we're, um, you know, we've been talking to a lot of people and I've been trying to, I mean, I had some great conversations last year with Mencia and, um, you know, and trying to get some of this stuff on their radar. I just don't think, you know, people are really realizing that how much energy that, you know, a correctional facility <laughs> uses. For right, example. right. And how do you publish, maybe publish some of that on your, yeah. on your website and, and say, yeah. wow, look at this, you know, our highest octane, you know, uh, facilities need, need help. Right. You know, DNR got some um, money with the federal stimulus, um, you know, in the 2010 or tw 2009, John, remind me, and they got some for doing some solar on, um, you know, some of their park buildings and stuff like that. They, they have some challenges because they, they're not, they don't want to take down any trees to put up solar panels. Um, right. You know, but, and, you know, some of them are more seasonal facilities. As I said, we've got some that are 24-7 facilities that might make good candidates. I know I'm running up on 7 o'clock. Is there, I can yammer with the best of them, but um, is there other questions that people have? Thanks for your work. Yeah, it's really exciting. It, it, I mean, I really want to instill with this group, there's some state agency staff people that are really doing really phenomenal, you know, things and trying to move the needle. And um, I think what's helpful for us is having those metrics. One quick story is like uh, MnDOT, they, um, MnDOT, they have 700 and some facilities, but once we started to accumulate all this water data, for example, they had energy people have been tracking that for a couple of decades. I think water is one that, you know, agencies haven't looked at as closely. And although MnDOT hasn't watered lawns at any of their facilities in 20 years, but the civil engineer from MnDOT got, you know, the data, uh, the consumption and, you know, an aggregate that we had and he hired a firm to go out and basically do a water audit of his 125 highest consuming water facilities and counted every fixture and detailed every single process. And now that's giving MnDOT, you know, a roadmap for making their corrective actions to really reduce their water consumption by 15%. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we need to do when, you know, people know what the information says and that, you know. That's great. So, yeah. Group yeah. problem solving. Yeah, yeah, that's why that the dashboard idea to me is a great idea. It's just really a quick way for people to, to learn, you know, what's going on in various areas. 
I know it. Well, it was, we had a funny call today with some staff from the Department of Ag and the governor set up this biofuels com, uh, uh, council. And so people were wondering, what is the state agency doing for biofuels? And they didn't really realize that we have now been keeping track of how many gallons of you know, B5, B10, B20, we're using how much E85, all of those things. And so, you know, I think we'll be able to share three years, you know, at least three years worth of data with the council so they can see where we are making some impact and, you know, where there's agencies and places that we need to make improvements. And, you know, that the transparency is important and having that real accurate data is also important. Well, Ann, thank you a million for taking the time and efforts. Uh, sorry about the technical stuff, but uh, you know we we uh, we've 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 uh, been through all kinds of uh, opportunities with that uh, over the last couple months. So, anyway, thank you so much, and and uh, look forward to talking and, with you again in the future. Everybody, and can I? You can. Can, can I make? Sure, John. Doug, can I make a comment? Oh, sure. Uh, and I just. Uh, Obviously, you and I have known each other uh, for a million for years, John. <laughs> and I am so pleased that you have taken all of your wonderful experience and expertise and are sharing it with all of us in your current position. That's really, really appreciated by me and I'm sure everybody else. Well, thank you, John. You know, I mean, it's fun to see all my friendly faces. John and I have gone go way back. Doug's wife worked with me a million years ago, Doug. That, you know, that's 30 years ago. That's yeah. when I first met Doug. Chris, you know, at the Science Museum and Jay, certainly, Hamilton. So, you know, I, it's, um, I really appreciate sharing this with folks and knowing what we're doing. And, again, I think some of the state agencies um, – are trying to do the right thing we need some more resources you know to be able to do it because we really do want to be leading by example and um, really you know being able so that the governor can and the lieutenant and governor can stand up you know and tell businesses and others that you know they're not asking them to do anything different than they're not than you know what state agencies are doing so yeah, exactly and it, uh, with all the things that have happened this year so far it's been I'm sure really challenging so Oh, yes. I'm sure that our solid waste is going to go up dramatically in certain facilities where they've been going through lots of masks and rubber gloves and personal protective equipment. Yeah. Um, you know, some of our agencies aren't driving as much, but then some agencies like MnDOT to do COVID used to have two or three people in a truck. Now they're just having one person in a truck go to a site. Um, even at the Department of, uh, you know, ad administration, um, on the buildings where we did have people occupied, they, you know, added a lot more air exchanges, you know, in the, um, in the building. So we'll probably be consuming, you know, of the buildings that are occupied, we'll be consuming more energy as we try to make sure we're bringing in enough fresh air to make sure everybody's safe. So am I, I'm giving you the precursor that the 2020 data is going to look a little weird. <laughs> 2019 data, you know, it was cold and we had lots of fuel consumed and we had to heat a lot of buildings, but it'll look probably similar to 2018, but 2020 will be very odd. Yeah. So thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Keep up the good work, Renewable Energy Society.